there is one profession you all have left out of the OPA, the professional politician. <laughs> and I don't think you're <laughs> anxious to have us either, <laughs> which is quite understandable. Your organization, the OPA I've known for long, we've agreed on some issues, we disagreed on many others, but you all are people who have made a lasting contribution to the economy and society. Today, you are meeting here not merely to witness the third apex national awards, but at a time when our country is facing a crisis unprecedented in our modern history. An economic crisis just started when our fragile economy was able to recover by 2017 to have a surplus in the primary budget. And then they were hit with a number of other events. The 52-day uh, gap when the government was thrown out, followed by a security issue that of Easter bombing, followed by a political economic issue of reducing taxes, followed by, that's in, by 2019, by 2020 we were hit by COVID and as we went along, wrong decisions not to bring in fertilizer. And a decision to maintain an artificial rate of exchange. All this brought about the crisis which we faced in January and February this month. This crisis, economic crisis in turn, led to political protests, first led by youth and the middle class, and subsequently taken over by more violent extremists, which pushed the young idealists out. We witnessed two outbursts of violence. The second one aimed at actually bringing the government machinery to a halt by taking over all the establishment necessary for that fact. Fortunately, as the Honourable Speaker knows, the Parliament was saved. And now we've gone through a period of establishing law and order because the instability of the economy on one hand, severe instability of the economy, with the other hand, the severe inst political instability the loss that we, Sri Lanka has suffered on that cannot be counted. But now we are back again. And how do we face the future? The situation here is normal. And I will not be extending the emergency. And I think it will lapse by the end of the week. It shows that stability has returned. But that is not enough. How do we handle the problems that we have? How do we go forward? I'd like to tell all of you, there is no looking back. There is no going to what it was in 2019 or 2020. We have to think. We have to have attitudinal change, as the Honourable Speaker mentioned. If we do that, then this country will have a future. Otherwise, we will become another Lebanon. This is the stark choice before you. Whether we like it or not, we have no choices in the solutions. The way we have gone has left us only one path to go. I need not tell you, I think Mr. Vikramanath would have done, how bad the economy is. At one time, just after I became Minister of Finance, I found that I was richer than the, um, the Republic of Sri Lanka as far as foreign exchange was concerned. Most of you were. Because that day we had nothing. And I had $1,000 at home which I had saved from a trip. So I was more than 1,000 times uh, richer than the Republic. But if you take a person like uh, Mr. Sanjeev Garden, he would have been about a million times richer than the Republic. <laughs> so nevertheless, that was what we was. There were times when we were looking at getting two, three million dollars 
just to pay off a bill. We are out of that stage now, fortunately. But we are not out of the woods. We cannot go on as an import-dependent economy with the balance of trade not in our favor. What are we going to do now? There is a short term, what you call stabilization. Well, we are now discussing with the IMF to finalize a staff level agreement. And we had the nitty gritty. Now, when you set the criteria and targets, you know, quarter percent can make a difference between prosperity and disaster. When that is over, the staff level agreement will come in. And that will give us confidence. Money will come in from some of the donors, from uh, some of the multilateral organizations, some investors would mind taking the risk. But we still have then, uh, with Lazards are preparing our debt sustainability plan. We have gone, we've got to discuss firstly with our official creditors. Now there are two groups. The West, we think, have a haircut, and the Chinese would like to give additional loans to pay off these loans. So there has to be one approach. And we are talking with Japan how this could be achieved. And we'll talk with China, or the start of the talks with India. Others will follow. And the more difficult issue of how do you deal with the private creditors? The monies that are invested there are not all by multi-billionaires, remember. A lot of the money are from pension funds, from other earnings, from banks. And a haircut means those pensioners have to take a lot. We know the situation where we are in, where the EPF is today worth half it was three years ago. So will, will they take that cut? That, that's what you've got to decide. Once we've done that, we have to increase revenue. The state corporations cannot run at a loss. So they've got to catch up on the subsidies or the subsidization they did earlier. We have to increase taxes. And there will be the banks are very uncertain. There will be bankruptcies. There will be small and medium enterprises affected. That we have to face and the government is preparing measures for that. But let's ensure that is only for a short term and not even for the medium term. To do so, we must at the same time, by look at our stabilization, look at our path for recovery. If we move fast, then this will be a short pain. If we still keep arguing, then we are all going to suffer. So we have to change this model. Firstly, we are going to have large number of debts to pay, foreign debts. So we have to become an export-oriented economy in which we keep earning more and more foreign exchange. To that, we have become to com competitive. We have to become competitive. State sector and the private sector. So a highly competitive, export-oriented economy. We've got to transform to that. There are no other way out. A market, we are a country with 22 million people. We have to find markets outside. We have to compete with other countries. We have to look at new markets. The only way out is through trade integration. There is no other way, either bilateral free trade agreements or regional trade agreements, which is more for Southeast Asia and East Asia. But we have to do this. Within our own region by 2050, going from South, Saudi Arabia to Indonesia, there will be an additional 500 million people, maybe more. Better off than today, all the people are better off than today. Now that's a big market. So we're having a market at our doorstep. I know you yourselves had many arguments with us on trade integration. It cannot be avoided and you will not lose out on it. That we will ensure. If you don't go for that market, you have no future. All of you have to look out. Go out, we have to help you. The government has to come with plans to help you. We have to find this big market to become competitive. 
and there are areas to look at like logistics. We can serve the whole region if Colombo Harbour, Ambantota and Trincomalee are properly developed. And one other area, as you mentioned here, agriculture. With 500 additional million people to speak, uh, to feed, why not agriculture? Modernize agriculture, not the traditional agriculture. There are many of you here who can help in that, who will take part in that. The services, the new technologies, developing tourism to a different level. You will know much more than I do. You all know we have to get ready for the fourth industrial revolution. And you all know what those technologies are, how it can be used, and how you can make money. So that's what we want you to do. But it means a complete restructuring of our economy. When the government sector falls, there still we must have enough money and enough income to fund education and health. A new system of education, a social mobility comes from education and a health system and housing. Those are basic needs. So we've got to move towards the social market economy. That is restructuring what we have, economy. Then the governance itself. I mean, every, everyone admits this model has failed. Now, are we going to do the same politics again? To bring the same model back? This is the question for all those in politics, both inside the parliament and outside. How are we going to restructure? It's not reform, it has to be restructuring of the whole system. So we are trying at the Honourable Speaker, you know, the new, way, new experiment. Firstly, all right, let's have the 22nd Amendment and pass it. The Minister is handling that. Let's get back to what it was. If, I mean, I am all for it, we are all for it. Then we are trying to make Parliament into a government by having oversight committees, by having a national council. The oversight committees will not only have members of Parliament, but it will have, they can invite five youth representatives who can ask questions from the parties with the permission of the speaker, with the chairman. While they cannot write into the report their views, they can have the right to put an addendum to the reports as to their views. Now that is far reaching. No country, no other country in the world has allowed the oversight committees for young people to come in and take part. So we have to make a success of it. We'll have other committees that we'll overlook. There'll be about five committees covering finance, public finance, the COP, uh, Committee on Public uh, Accounts. We'll look at a Ways and Means Committee, Committee on Finance, Banks and Financial Services, Committee on uh, Restructuring of uh, State-Owned Enterprises. So they have to work together with the government. So the parliament becomes a government. They become a part of the government. And with us willing, to invite some of the members of the committees to come for cabinet meetings. And the National Council, which consists main, will consist of all the party leaders to see where we can reach a consensus and try and reach a common minimum program. We also have to think of our electoral procedures, of our voting procedures. We, this electoral system with what we call, uh, with uh, Preference vote is the one that is responsible for a lot of the damage to the system. Then we should be in this parliament, we must have the capability of coming up with a new system. We cannot be passing it on to others. The baby is ours. We've took it, we've got to carry it. And if possible from there, go ahead to a new constitution. That's something that we can do. But there's much more. So parliament will have a large amount of legislation. Because climate change alone will take a few months for the legislation to pass. New ways, the rights of women. As even here, as my wife said, Ruchira Gunasekara has sort of stormed and taken over male bastion. <laughs> I don't know if it's like the fall of the Bastille, but nevertheless, <laughs> there's a lot more that has to be, uh, lot more that has to be done. So we, we, while the parliament can, can do all, we thought we will ask the country. And uh, 
the former speaker, uh, Honorable Karu Jaya Surya, and Mr. Victor Ivan uh, came up with the idea of Jana Sabhas, which can get the ideas of the people and pass it on. So that, that's, that's a good concept. Especially those who came out onto the road who wanted change, come there, talk with the others. And there be people who may not want change, so they should talk with the ones who want the change. It is not something that we politicians can do. I don't think we'll have the credibility. Therefore, the credibility is what we have established by giving it to outsiders. So in this, where you all can join in, firstly on the economic side, secondly on the social side, we need a strong civil society. Civil society that's able to influence. Even the oversight committees, while we call young people, you are not left out. When agriculture comes in, you all can come in on agriculture, on health, on health, like the American uh, oversight committee. So you all, all can help to develop it. And we want all of you to come. And we want the country also. We must sort out our problems among the ethnic groups. We must sort it gone on too long. The war was over in 2009. There are no need to fight again. Let's, let's be as Sri Lankans, and not only as Sri Lankans, we are also looking at the diaspora. That's both, uh, it's a strength. It's also a source of investment. So I've decided that we will set up a diaspora office, which will deal with the diaspora separately and the groups that they have. So this is a part of the new Sri Lanka where we are widening the horizons for economic activity and for governance. And I'm sure you all will take part uh, wholeheartedly. And let's all get together because this is the last chance we have. If we don't pull it out, I don't think there's going to be, this is the third apex, no? I don't think there'll be a fourth uh, national apex award. Thank you. <laughs>